Hello folks. Welcome to the program today. I hope you had a great Easter. And I kind of want to keep the topic on those lines a little bit here since I wasn't able to be with you last week. But just want to thank you for joining today. And uh, we just want to talk about the goodness of God. You know, God is a God that revealed himself throughout mankind's existence. And you can see that in the different pages of the Bible. You should read the Old Testament and our New Testament, just seeing where the the lives of the apostles and all the old patriarchs of, of, uh, of the Lord, how they followed him in life. And we see God's power in creation that so fills our life with awe and wonder, doesn't it? You look up at the stars at night, and you just got to know that there's a God out there. All the difference in the trees and the plants and the birds and the animals, I tell you what, it's just incredible the evidence that God leaves in our world. And we see through the entire life and ministry of Christ, uh, God's power to love and to heal and to set free. It's what he did in the New Testament. The Bible says that Jesus Christ went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's the enemy. Always remember that. But God came close to us when Jesus came into this world and walked our earth and breathed our air. He came close to it. He, he was touchable. He didn't remain up in the sky someplace where we couldn't see him. He came to our world and became touchable. And that's what I like about Jesus Christ. And that's what I like about the God that we have. But perhaps nowhere in God's Word is it so codified and settled as the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. That's what it all boils down to, folks. If, the, if there's not an empty tomb there, then the Bible says that if, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then you're still in your sins. You're still headed uh, toward a fiery hell without Him. But praise God, the tomb is empty. And I'm very thankful for that. Tombs can tell us a lot about a person. You know, uh, one of the greatest tombs known of is that of King Tut's, discovered in Egypt in 1922. King Tut ruled in Egypt in about uh, 1344 B.C. He was nine years old. Boy, go figure on that one. Can you imagine a nine-year-old running a kingdom? I don't know, but <laughs> I know what nine-year-old kids are like, and I don't think they're really uh, set to run a kingdom, hardly their life, much less a kingdom. Candy for everybody. You know, I mean, I, it's hard to tell what it would be like, but... Anyway, his tomb was laden with all kinds of treasure and riches. His coffin was made of solid gold. You ought to look it up sometime, just all the different... That's uh, incredible how they buried him back then. But so meticulous were the workers that it took eight years to document, categorize, and remove everything out of that tomb. Pretty incredible. Now contrast that with the simple tomb that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the universe maker, was laid in. Contrast King Tut's compared to Jesus' tomb. You know... The story of Christ's empty tomb is still changing lives today, folks. And I might ask, is he, has he changed your life? Have you allowed him to change your life? Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is revered for being honored as a resting place of many brave Americans. Have you ever been there? Just look at all the crosses. Any way you look, they're just all in line. It's an amazing place. But each one of those crosses represents a life that was, that was sacrificed for our country, for your freedom, actually. The pyramids of Egypt are famous because they contain the mummified bodies of kings, ancient kings. Muhammad's tomb is noted for the stone coffin and the bones that are still in it, the bones that are still contained within it. Aren't you glad you don't worship a God that's bones are still in his coffin? Jesus Christ's tomb, his coffin, is empty because he's not there. The garden tomb of Jesus is famous. Why? Because it's empty. That's what makes it famous, folks. There's a Therein is the ultimate demonstration of God's power in Jesus Christ. The ultimate demonstration of power was raising Christ from the dead, making that tomb empty. It was the final fulfillment of countless prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah, God's very own Son. God's Word contained not only the how and when where, or where He would be born, but how and where He would die. And more importantly, when He would rise again from the dead. It was a definite de demonstration, a definitive demonstration of power over all of life and death. God conquered everything in Jesus Christ. Life, death, he, he's, he's the God of it all, folks. Faith in, the, in, uh, faith in the resurrection of Christ transforms fearful lives, filling them with hope and courage to go out and change the world. That's what he did in my life, and that's what he can do in your life. When you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, he really can change your life, folks. It's not just some pipe dream. It's not just a little pie in the sky, a, a fairy tale wish. He can transform your life. 
He give, he'll give you a reason to live, a reason to keep pushing on, never to stop, never to short, go, stop short, never to quit. He, he gives you a reason to get up in the morning. Amen. That's what it's all about, folks. you got to have a reason to get up in the morning. If you don't have a reason to get up in the morning, you know, life becomes kind of futile. just becomes pretty uh, lackluster, just boring. Um, but in spite of all that, in spite of the goodness of God, most choose not to follow Christ. Allowing doubt and unbelief to rule and reign in their mind and their soul. That's the way that most people choose, and that's unfortunate. Jesus said this would happen in Luke 16, 31. He said unto them, if, you, if, he, if people don't hear Moses and the prophets, in other words, the Bible, if they don't hear the Bible or believe the Bible, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And he evidenced that by, the, by himself, raising himself from the dead. And still many don't believe. But the resurrection is an event that's rooted in time and history. It's recorded. It's not just something, not, again, not a little fairy tale. It's actually recorded that it happened. The question is, do you believe it or not? And who do you believe that Jesus Christ is? Uh, and you know, it's timeless in its influential impact. It doesn't wear out. It's almost 2,000 years ago. And it, and it hasn't worn out. It hasn't grown lesser. It, his, his, his name just continues to keep on going throughout all time. King Tut, yeah, whatever. You know, we don't know a whole lot about him. Only thing, only reason he seems important is just because he was he was uh, buried with so many of this world's precious things. Other than that, doesn't mean a whole lot. Couldn't tell you much about him. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, he's all over the place. You can't go to a Bible or to a library and pick up very many books until you will look through it and you'll find some reference to Scripture. In Washington, his his words, the verses are inscribed half inch deep in the granite and the marble around there. It's pretty hard to escape it. Plus, the Bible says that he writes his word on the fleshy tablets of your heart. So it's timeless in its influential impact. Like a stone dropped in the water, its effect on the soul of men ripple timeless throughout eternity. From, from then till forever. It, it, it just keeps on rippling. It keeps on going. It keeps on affecting man. God invaded mankind's world and left a mark that split time from B.C. to A.D. God did that. He has always had a higher plan for man. He's always had a higher plan for you than just the, the everyday run-of-the-mill, live your life and barely get by. Or God's got better things in store for you, folks, if you just begin to turn your life over to Him. He chose at that time before the foundations of the world to show man the face of God. God came onto our scene, born as a babe in a manger. In Christmas we celebrate that. Then 33 years later, died on a cross for you and I. And all through them years right there, God showed the face of God, or Jesus Christ showed the face of God. Romans 5, 8 says, but God, but God demonstrated, He proved His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies of the cross, enemies of Christ, He died for us. His power and authority bowed to no man, to no religious, political, or relig power of the day. And nor today. He doesn't bow to any man. He bowed His knee only humbly to wash his disciples feet that's when the god the creator of this universe bowed his knee was to help somebody else that's pretty incredible he showed his power to the most humble and sinful of us all to anybody that hungered for righteousness redemption anybody that had ears to hear that if you wanted to hear the voice about about the things of god he's there for you to them he preached a new kingdom that was now in their midst he was right there with them. The kingdom of God is within you. It's right here. In fact, that's what it says. Luke 17, 21 and 22 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you, Jesus said. He's as close as the whisper of his name. All you got to do is call out to him and he's right there. You don't have to get on a plane and fly someplace to try to find him. He is as close as the mention of his name. Thank God for that. In many acts of power, he revealed the evidence of his kingdom. As he was walking on this earth, the different miracles that he did. He, the lives around him were being changed and filled with hope. When he entered the city... At Palm Sunday, a week before the crucifixion, they hailed it as triumph. They were praising him. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But soon the acts of betrayal and suffering and arrest, the mockery of a trial, a horrific beating and a crucifixion, and alas, a dark, cold grave. 
sealed by a stone. Pretty bleak day that day was. I wasn't there, but I can read about it. I can kind of put myself in that place and just try to feel what was going on that day. Pretty dark. In fact, the sky grew dark as well. Many other things. You know, and it looked like it was over. It looked like it was the end. I imagine hearts had fallen, sunk deep, hopes dashed. So in that grave, their hopes were ended, is what was kind of going through their minds. Evidenced by a stone seal rolled in front of it. That big stone seal really kind of put the clincher on it, so to speak. They saw him die. They saw him go get carried in there. They saw the stone rolled in front. They saw the guards with the Roman seal placed on it. Verifying that, verify, verifying that Christ's body was in there. Pretty bleak. But then early that third day, something was different. There was a new freshness. freshness tangible vigor in the air, I bet. From a place where there was only disappointment and despair, hope now filled the atmosphere. Luke 24, 39 Jesus said, Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. It is I. When he appeared to Mary and to different disciples and to many people at one time in different places. The power of, from God was on display, folks. He was living loud. They experienced something they had never known before. Never before had one claimed to be able to come back from the dead. And then did it. Jesus Christ did that. He did it for you. He did it for me. Thank God for that. Only now could people see. Only now can we see after that. Can we, could, could people begin to understand the cross. And why he went. God hadn't lost to evil. But rather made an open show. Triumphing over evil. Exposing it for the utter counterfeit that it is. That's what Jesus Christ did. Revelations 1.8 says, I am, Jesus said this, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. He just jingles them old keys. He's got the keys of hell and of death. Praise God for that. God hadn't lost to the opposition, but used this event to suck the evil one in and destroy his plan and power over the people that chose freedom. The devil doesn't have that power over you if you choose freedom, freedom in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 8 says, None of the rulers of that age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had they really known what was happening, Satan thought he was getting the upper hand. The devil bit on it, hook, line, and sinker. He thought he had him down, he killed him, it was done. He could finally reign supreme. Had they known what really happened, that the spotless, sinless Son of God paid for the sins of the entire world, for whosoever puts, his faith, puts their faith and trust in Him, their sins are gone. Jesus Christ paid for those sins so that they could live forever. Had the rulers of that age known that, they would not have killed the King of Glory. But they bit. See, the devil no longer has authority or power over you. The only power he has over you is the power that you allow him to have. So that's where you got to put your foot down and say, Devil, that's it, man. I'm done with you. I'm walking with Jesus Christ now. And then the devil can try to affect you, but he cannot do anything. He, he cannot destroy you when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you can't go through tough times or battles or different things like that or even cost you your life. But he can't destroy your spirit, the part of you that's going to live forever. God's going to give you a new body. Don't get so worked up about this one. you got a new one coming. As long as you put your faith and trust and keep on going Him. So tragedy was turned into triumph. The ultimate sacrifice had been paid. He redeemed us. He purchased our freedom. Praise God for that. Now all that remains is the claiming. You've got to take that redemption certificate and give it, say, I, Jesus Christ paid for my sins. He give you got to have your ticket to get to heaven. God paid for it all, but you have to still take it. You have to you have to claim it. You know what I mean? So have any stones 
Have any stones sealed your hopes, your dreams, or your future? Has any big stone been rolled in front of you? That's what I'm asking you today. Is your life, does it have just a big stone in there? Any hopes, dash, dreams forfeited? God obtained power for you to be able to break free and to begin to realize your goals as you put your trust in Him. He can roll them stones out of the way. If you allow Him, Christ will begin to remove the stones of uncertainty today so that you'll be able to begin to see what He has rescued you from. You'll be able to see the depths that He has rescued you from, the place that you were headed. We're all destined for hell without Jesus Christ and putting our faith and trust in Him. But as you put your faith and trust in Him, He gives you the power to begin to see what life is really like. And it's a beautiful thing, folks. You begin, you'll begin to recognize the need you have for His forgiveness. So don't let his, his, his sacrifice on the cross be of no worth to you. It does you no good if you don't accept it, if you don't claim it and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Don't face death on your own. Face it with Jesus. Because we're all going to face it, but you want to face it with Jesus. Death is a dark, strange reality for most people. They know it happens. They see its evidence when they go to a funeral and they see their dead loved one laying in a coffin there. Just a shell. They can tell the spirit's gone. The life is not in them anymore. So that they see it, but they want to try to avoid it as long as they possibly can. Perhaps because we're... Uh, the leaders of ingenuity and science and have learned to control so much that all we can do to fend off, we, we want to do all we can do to fend off death as long as possible. You know, in the not too distant past, if you lived to be 50, in your 50s, you were considered old. Holy smokes, I'd be about all croaked off by now if that was the case. But now because of medicines and technology, people can live double that. Pretty amazing. But why do we do these things? And praise God, I mean, we want to live long lives. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. But we, we want to keep on pushing it up because we don't want to face death. You got to be ready to face death, folks. Now, uh, so, so we as a society tend to push death off as long as we can so we don't even got to think about it. Well, you got to think about it while you're alive. You got to think about it. You don't, you don't have to fear death. doesn't mean you ain't going to be... Oh, you know, when it comes, not that you're going to enjoy that part, but you don't have to fear it because we know what comes after that. And that's an eternity with Christ if you've asked Him to be your Lord and Savior on this side of heaven. You know, so, so we, anyway, we keep on pushing it off. But at some point short of Christ's return, death always catches you. You cannot escape it. You will face it. Then everything you've worked for, and deemed all important. If it was not done because of Christ, all of it's going to be counted as worthless and futile. It will do you no good anymore after that point in time, after you take your last breath. Sure, your kids or your family can be blessed with your riches, what you leave behind, and that's fine and that's good and that's admirable. But you yourself personally, it will do you no good anymore. Only what you've done for Christ is going to matter if you put your faith and trust in Him. Most don't want to see their life's works Come to naught. They, don't, they just don't even want to think about that. And as humans, we are inclined to avoid the final futility of all of our endeavors. We just don't want to see that happen in our life. We don't want to believe it's all going to come to an end. But it will. I can promise you that it will. The Bible says it's appointed unto man who wants to die. And after this, the judgment. It's appointed. There's no way you can escape it. Unless you do what you have done unto the Lord, as unto the Lord, it's all futile. It all doesn't matter after that. We live vicariously through celebrities and sports figures and politicians to whom we pay great homage and support. We buy their tickets, we buy their jerseys, we, we, we plug into every event we can with them, and we live through them. We seek thrills to escape and numb the soul, so the truth that is being whispered in our heart doesn't sting as much. We just want to keep our lives busy and filled with things so that we don't have to pay regard to the truth of your conscience is actually the Holy Spirit convicting your conscience, convicting your, your soul of wrongdoing and your need for God. He who dies with the most toys still dies, folks. Doesn't matter how much he thinks he's taken with him. In seeking freedom from death, we become slave to our fears. We fear anything that can hasten death. So we become slave to our fears. So physical death is inescapable. You might as well face it. It's, it's going to happen. There's a lie, there lies a tombstone in a cemetery that reads, Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, 
so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. An unknown passerby read those words and scratched beneath them these words. To follow you I am not content until I know which way you went. Yeah, so one way or another, you're going to die. But yeah, you do want to follow somebody whose paths lead to heaven. And Jesus Christ laid that path out for you. So you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ so that you can make heaven. You know, when the centurion guard at the foot of the cross heard Jesus say, It is finished. I think it sounded more like a beginning than an ending. Because something happened to that fellow that day. He said, Surely, truly, this was the Son of God. Something happened inside of him. And it is finished when Christ said that. And the heavens shake and the earth, the earth broke up in pieces and the skies were dark. Thunder and lightning going off all over. I tell you what, what an incredible day. God died for us. And that guard realized that. And there was something inside of him, I believe, that was like a sense of hope. Not just the sheer death on the cross, but that death had a reason, it had a purpose. And that purpose was to buy our souls. So something happened that day. It's like a new way had been created, established, provided. Which it, it indeed was. All of those. An invitation offered and extended to whosoever will. And we read that later on in the Bible. Whosoever will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You're going to be born again. You're going to be saved. And so it was that the power of death itself, which the scripture referred to as the last great enemy, was itself destroyed by the one who held power over it. Along with it, fear and futility of life also died for those who are in Christ. Again, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you have purpose for your life. You will live forever. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Remember, he came to our earth, he was born, he lived just like we do, had bodies just like we do, felt pain just like we do, so that by his death he might destroy the, him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death. Fear of death holds people as slaves, but you don't have to be held that way if you know where you're going. You can be free, you can live life free if not worrying about tomorrow if I'm going to make it or if I'm going to die or not. Praise God again. We pray for long life and we, we do want to live without pain as much as possible. But a point in time, I'm going to die. But I don't have to be afraid of that. I don't have to let that thought rule my life. And I run my life according to that thought. I can just live freely in the Lord. Put a smile on my face and just enjoy the day that we have. It's the only one you're promised, by the way. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, Oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Just like the victorious liberating army that raises its flag over a defeated foe, if you've never, ever seen movies like that. Just God in Christ staked the cross as his flag over the defeated foe of death. God in Christ planted that cross over his defeated foe of death. <clears throat> God did something that day. It was, it was amazing, folks, what he did. He planted that cross over the devil's kingdom. He bought back any soul, any soul, whosoever believes in him. The devil cannot prevent that. You just put your faith and trust in him. You know, we quite naturally have a bent left rim. We just always kind of, we let go of the steering wheel. We're always kind of pulling toward the ditch. You always got to hang on to this thing and try to ride it and keep it on the road. Our, our very nature spouts impurity. We became contrary to God way back in the Garden of Eden. Because God man, God, man had a perfect relationship until mankind fell and sin entered in. And then mankind was kicked out of the Garden because of it. So we have a broken relationship with God. But God saw way down the corridors of time. And Jesus Christ was going to come to pay for our sins. So we have a broken relationship with God, both in the depths of our souls and the actions of our hearts. We do things that are contrary to Him. So it was for those that Jesus came. It was sinners like me that Jesus came. Sinners like you that Jesus came. A traitorous tax collectors have become testimonies of God's generosity. Harlots have become heroes. Fishermen made fishers of men. 
He wants to turn your mess into a message, your test into a, your testimony. God wants to do something with your life. Jesus came to offer not just eternal life, but abundant life, folks. Not just to add days to our life, but add life to our days. That's what he came for, to set us free, to make your life worth something, to make you realize your life is worth something, because everybody's life is. But it's only those who put their faith and trust in Christ that can really realize the value of life. So if are you bored in your life, or are you, are you feeling unfulfilled? It seems that that goes through people's minds a lot anyway from what you hear. Do you find yourself wondering, what am I really here for? What, real, what is the real purpose of my life? Well, the Bible says you were created to praise God, to worship God, to be with God, to love God, because He loves you. So if you have found your life story kind of stuck, stuck in a rut, the resurrection testifies that God can join you in finishing your story. He can, he can bring it all to pass. He can put a period on the end of that dude. Make your life mean something. And so how do you know this power? It's, it's an exchange, exchange program. You give God your life. He gives you his life. True life. We become more Christ-like as we look to him every day. We experience true life. As we proclaim him and die to ourselves, then we truly begin to live, folks. His life works in us and through us. Helps make us more like him all the time. And it's a great thing. That is what it means to invite Christ into your life and to be your Lord and Savior. Someone said you got to die before you die. Because there's no chance afterwards. You got to die before you die. Because there's no chance afterwards. Have you heard? Frank died. Yeah, he died. Yeah, it was a, it was a, quite a day. But hey, look at him. Look at him. Look at him now. It's not, no longer I that live, Paul said, the apostle Paul said, but it's Christ that lives in me. And I could say the same thing. Although I kind of veer off to the left, I still got that stinking old bent left rim to contend with and to pull her back on the road, you know, but, but that's all part of life. We all have those different trials and temptations and stuff, but you want to be pulling on the steering wheel. You just don't want to let go and let it hit the ditch. You want to be pulling on her, bringing her back, just walking with the Lord. And God can do that for you. So I just ask you today, has the resurrection really made a difference in your life? And if not, would you just ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I invite you now to come into my life today. I ask, Lord, I want to experience your resurrection life. And he will do that. And then just get in your Bible and start reading in the New Testament. Just start reading in there. You don't have to understand everything. You're going to see stuff in there that you're scratching your head and you're wondering. Just take what you do know in. Just keep on reading it. Your, your questions will get answered. And God will just begin to lead you through this life in a good way. Anyway, thank you so much, folks. Thanks for joining today. And God really does love you. He's got a great plan for your life. God bless till next time. Amen.